I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Atom, and today we're going to be reading Molecules to Materials. This is a lab manual in Unit 1. Section 1, Matters, Structure, and Function, Mimicking the Stickability of Geckos. On a cold December day, an engineering student named Elliot Hawks acted like a slow motion Spider-Man. He inched his way up a glass wall behind his science lab. He was able to stick to the glass because he was testing a new kind of material that was attached to his hands and feet. Materials are substances that are designed to be used for certain applications. They can be natural or made by humans. Researchers like Hawks are interested in creating materials that have a set of properties that will allow them to be used in a particular way. A property is a measurable or observable characteristic of a substance. For example, the material used by Hawks to scale the glass wall was designed by hum humans to mimic gecko feet. Geckos are lizards that can stick to almost any surface they walk on. They can run up smooth walls and across the ceiling without falling. This stickability is called adhesiveness. It is a property that gecko feet, glue, and tape all share. Geckos are able to stick to most surfaces because of their unique feet. Their feet are lined with millions of tiny hair called setae. The setae create an attraction between the gecko's feet and the surface. Unlike adhesives such as glue or tape, however, the gecko's sticky feet can attach and detach from the surface easily. This means the adhesiveness doesn't have to be permanent like glue. This property makes geckos particularly interesting for materials scientists want who want to create new adhesive materials for a variety of functions. Materials science is the field of science that focuses on the relationship between the structure and properties of different materials. The stem cycle. Scientists are so intrigued by the gecko's adhesive feet that they have been trying to mimic it. They want to use it in applications as common as wigs and toupees that remain in place, and as cutting edge as robots that can catch space junk, such as satellites that are no longer working, and gear for soldiers so that they can climb walls without ladders. Researchers such as Hawks, who use scientific knowledge to design a technology such as the gecko-like hand-sized adhesives, are a good example of the STEM cycle in action. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Science is all knowledge learned from experiments. Broadly, science is the search for explanations about the natural world, and scientists use evidence to form conclusions that support those explanations. Engineers then use scientific knowledge to design new technologies that solve problems. Math is a tool that both scientists and engineers use to capture results and to communicate those results to others. Scientists use a scientific process to guide them in developing a replicable experiment as they seek out answers to questions about the world around them. There are eight steps that scientists often follow to answer questions using data from experiments. These steps provide scientists with a logical framework to go about answering their questions. Conducting experiments. Scientists always begin with a question. For example, one question that scientists interested in the gecko's ability to stick to different surfaces might want to answer is, how does the number of setae or hair on a gecko's feet affect its adhesiveness? Scientists use existing knowledge to research their question so they can find out what is already known. After scientists have re researched their question, they form a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a statement that can be proved true or false. The hypothesis is the scientist's prediction based on what is known about the answer to the question. An example of a hypothesis is, more setae on a gecko's feet increase the gecko's adhesiveness, or Fewer setae on a gecko's feet increase the gecko's adhesiveness. Scientists then write a summary of the experiment they will conduct to test their hypothesis. The summary should include the basics of the data to be collected, the variables that will be tested, and the parts of the experiment that will remain constant in each test or trial. 
Scientists then list materials needed and the procedure they will follow. They will also draw a scientific diagram. They do this so anyone can use the same materials and follow the same steps to get similar results. They also want to create a record of their thinking. Scientists then conduct an experiment to test the hypothesis. An experiment is a specific procedure that tests if a hypothesis is true, false, or inconclusive. For example, scientists may create a model of a gecko's foot to test their hypothesis about the relationship between number of setae and adhesiveness. Scientists use experiments to look for patterns in data that can suggest a cause and effect relationship where one event or thing is the result of the other. A pattern is something that happens in a regular and repeated way. In order to discover a cause and effect relationship, scientists design experiments in, in a way that shows how changes to one thing causes something else to change in a predictable way. Scientists conduct experiments in a very specific way with variables and constants. A variable is something you change. It can be a factor, trait, or condition that can exist in differing amounts or types. There are independent and dependent variables in an experiment. For example, in an experiment testing how the number of setae on a gecko's feet affects the gecko's adhesiveness, the independent variable would be the different number of setae on the model gecko's feet. The dependent variable is what happens as a result of the independent variable. For example, the adhesiveness of the model feet is the dependent variable. Constants allow scientists to isolate one variable at a time to ensure the experiment results are valid. For example, the size and shape of a gecko foot would need to be constant, as would the kind of material the surface is made of. If any of these factors differ, it would be impossible to know whether the results were because of the number of setae or another factor. Finally, an experiment sometimes has a control. A control receives the same constants, but it is not exposed to the variable being tested. The control captures the effect of unknown variables. The results of the experiment are data, the measurement and observations gathered from an experiment. After data has been collected, scientists form a conclusion. The conclusion uses data from the experiment as evidence for why the hypothesis is true, false, or inconclusive. For example, after conducting an experiment to investigate how the number of setae on a gecko's feet affects its adhesiveness, scientists might discover that more setae make the gecko feet more adhesive, or they might find that the number of setae has no effect on adhesiveness. This would tell them that another factor must be responsible. They would need to conduct more experiments to collect additional data. Following a scientific process. Question. End with a question mark and do not include words such as I or because. Research. Include a minimum of three facts relevant to the question. Hypothesis. Write a concise statement that answers the question and can be proved true or false. Summarize experiment. Describe in two to three sentences the experiment you will do to test whether your hypothesis is true or false. Identify the independent and dependent variables, constants, and controls of the experiment. The independent variable is the variable changed. The dependent variable is what happens as a result of the independent variable. Constants of the experiment are conditioned unchanged during each trial. A control in the experiment captures the effect of unknown variables. Materials and procedures. Vertically list all materials needed for your experiment with quantities. Next, vertically list the numbered steps of your procedure. Note safety precautions. Scientific diagram. Draw a diagram of the experiment setup that is at least the size of your hand. Title it and include labels for all materials on the materials list. Data. Follow your test procedure and gather data, both observations and numbers, to determine whether the hypothesis is true, false, or inconclusive. Use proper units, title data tables, and tape into lab notebook. Conclusion. Use the data collected in the experiment to explain why the hypothesis is true, false, or inconclusive. 
Every conclusion must contain a minimum of three elements. One, restate your hypothesis. Two, make a claim, true, false, inconclusive. Three, use key points of data as evidence to support and explain your claim. A day in the life of a materials scientist. Vasav Sani is so afraid of spiders that his first instinct is to run in the other direction. In his line of study, that didn't seem to be a problem. Sani is a material scientist, meaning he focuses on the relationship between the structure and properties of different materials. But he, another materials scientist and a biologist who all work at the University of Akron in Ohio, decided that they wanted to figure out what made spider silk so sticky and created a synthetic material that has the same properties. At first, Sani didn't realize that in order to study spider silk, he would have to get close, really close to spiders. All of a sudden, Sani's research involved field trips to nature preserves and other spider habitats. Spider webs have long fascinated scientists. The thread that makes up the web is stronger than steel. At the same time, spiders add droplets to the thread that act like glue and are three times thinner than the diameter of a single hair. The drops have tremendous stickiness, but are also water resistant, which is useful in the rain. Sani and his colleagues want to turn their research into practical applications, such as bandages and other products that must remain sticky even when wet. What the spider does is evolution at its finest, said Sani's colleague, Ali Dinawala. They have survived by using nature effectively. The more we learn of how nature uses these materials, the better position we will be in to take advantage of this and design things based on what we learn. Matter, structure and properties. There are currently more than 300,000 different known materials. As scientists create and combine materials in new ways, that number continues to increase. Material scientists look for connections between the underlying structure of a material, its properties, how it can be changed and what it can do, its function. Structure is the way in which parts are put together to form a whole, while function is the normal action of something or how something works. A material structure is directly related to its function. Structure of matter. Understanding a material structure begins with a basic understanding of matter, anything that has mass and takes up space. Mass is a physical property of matter. It is a measure of the amount of matter that makes up an object or substance, and it is measured in grams. An atom is the smallest piece of matter that has the properties of an element, substances that are made up entirely of one kind of atom. To understand why a material has the properties it does, scientists begin with the atoms that make it up. Many properties that a material has are a result of the atoms that make it up. Atomic scale. Atoms are so tiny that we cannot see them. Because of this, scientists use scale to understand how atoms relate to everyday objects. Scale is the size, extent, or importance, magnitude, of something relative to something else. For example, think about all of the atoms that make up a grapefruit. If each atom were the size of a blueberry, the grapefruit would be the size of Earth. Atoms themselves are made up of smaller particles. These particles include protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and neutrons group together in the nucleus. These smaller particles are much smaller than the atom itself. If you were to open up the blueberry, representing the atom, the nucleus would be too small to see. Scale of an atom. If you were to make the blueberry the size of a football field, you would just be able to see the nucleus. It would be the size of a small marble. The nucleus is very dense because it holds all of the atom's protons and neutrons. Most of the atom's mass, 99.9%, .9 comes from the protons and neutrons. The electrons are in constant motion around the nucleus. However, most of the atom is filled with empty space. There are vast regions of space between each of the electrons and between the electrons and the nucleus. Scientists use what they know about an atom structure to create a scale model of an atom. Scale models 
are useful for scientists who want to understand how the various parts of the atom interact. This is because an atom is a system, a set of connected, interacting parts that form a new, uh, I'm sorry, that form a more complex whole. Periodic table of elements. Scientists never work with individual atoms because they are too small. Instead, they work with elements such as a gold bar or helium gas. An element is a pure substance. This means it is made entirely of one kind of atom that has distinct properties that do not vary from sample to sample. In the picture to the right, each gold bar is made up of many billions of gold atoms. It is the structure of the gold atom that gives the gold bar the properties that they have. Many of an element's properties are determined by the number of protons and neutrons its atoms have. Other properties are determined by an atom's number and arrangement of electrons. Predicting elements. Most material scientists agree that the single most important event that happened in their field came in 1864. This is when Russian scientist Dmitry Mendeleev put together a chart called the Periodic Table of Elements. This chart arranged all of the known elements according to their properties. When Mendeleev developed the periodic table, there were 63 known elements. His real genius was in predicting that elements existed that hadn't yet been discovered. His prediction was correct. There are currently 118 known elements, with the last four added just in 2016. Scientists are continuing to search for new elements. These 118 elements are the only substances needed to make all of the materials that exist. In the human body, there are many billions of atoms, but scientists believe that more than 95% of the body is made up of just six elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and calcium. The first 94 elements are believed to occur naturally. The rest are synthetic. This means they are formed through a chemical process developed by humans, as opposed to those of natural origin. Most of the elements that have been created last only seconds, at most before breaking apart into smaller elements. Each element on the periodic table is assigned a symbol and a number. The symbol comes from the name of the element's atom, in English or Latin and the atomic number comes from the number of protons found in the atom's nucleus. Neutrons and electrons don't define an element because the number of neutrons and electrons in an atom can fluctuate. The periodic table is organized from top to bottom in groups by increasing atomic number. The periodic table indicates some patterns among elements. For example, an element's place on the periodic table tells us about some of its properties, including how reactive its atoms are, and whether it is a metal, non-metal, or metalloid. Metals are shiny, malleable, and good conductors of electricity and heat. Almost 75% of all elements are metals, including mercury, zinc, gold, copper, iron, and other elements in columns one through 12 of the periodic table. Non-metals are brittle, dull, and poor conductors of electricity and heat. There are only 17 non-metals on the periodic table. Gases and elements on the far right of the periodic table are non-metals. Coal is an example of a non-metal. Metalloids are found between metals and non-metals on the periodic table. They are also called semiconductors because depending on what other molecules are around, they can sometimes conduct electricity. Metalloids have properties of both metals and non-metals, such as being shiny and hard, but brittle. Boron, silicon, and arsenic are metalloids. Here is the periodic table of elements. Energy changes matter. In order to understand how material scientists can create new materials with specific properties designed for a particular purpose, it is important to first understand the relationship between matter and energy. Matter can only change when enough energy is present. Energy is the ability to do work. 
Work is any change in position, speed, or state of matter due to force, a push or pull that acts on an object, changing its speed, direction, or shape. Examples of work, including heating an object or moving an object. There are two categories of energy, potential and kinetic. Potential energy is energy that is stored. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Each category of energy has different forms. Energy is never created or destroyed, but it can change from one form to another. Thermal energy is a form of kinetic energy. For example, all matter has a form of kinetic energy called thermal energy, which is the motion of atoms and molecules in a substance or object as its temperature increases. The faster that atoms and molecules move, the more thermal energy they have and the warmer they become. The amount of thermal energy present in a substance determines whether that substance is a solid, liquid, or gas, because thermal energy changes the motion of molecules. However, it doesn't change the chemical structure of the substance. For this reason, a change of state is considered a physical change. Whether you freeze or boil a cup of water, the water molecules are still water molecules. Thermal energy changes matter state. Frozen water, also called ice, is a solid. Solids have the least amount of thermal energy of any state. As a result, the atoms in a solid are closely packed together. They are always moving, but because of how close they are, they can only vibrate in place. They cannot move past one another. This is why solids, such as ice, keep their shape until something changes them. When thermal energy is added to solids, the atoms or molecules begin to move more quickly. When enough energy is added, they will expand and become a liquid. This is what happens when ice melts, turning into liquid water. The temperature at which a substance changes from a solid to a liquid is called its melting point. Different substances have different melting points depending on how much energy is needed to change them from a solid to a liquid. This, in turn, depends on the kind of atoms that make them up. The atoms in a liquid are less tightly packed than in a solid. They are in constant contact with one another, but they have enough energy to slide past one another. Therefore, matter in a liquid state takes the shape of its container, but has no shape of its own. When thermal energy is removed from a liquid, the kinetic, it, the kinetic energy of the atom and molecules decreases, causing them to slow down. When enough thermal energy is removed, the liquid will turn into a solid. This is called its freezing point. For example, water freezes when the temperature reaches zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. When enough thermal energy is added to a liquid, the atoms or molecules will move so quickly that the liquid will expand, becoming gas. This is called its substance boiling point, a substance's boiling point. The molecules in a gas have so much energy that they move far apart and bounce around randomly. As a result, matter in a gas state has no shape and spreads out into, a, into space. If a certain amount of gas is taken out of one container and placed into a container that is twice as large, the gas will expand to fill the larger container. Chemical energy. All matter also has a form of potential energy that is stored in the bonds holding together atoms and molecules. This is called chemical energy, and it is what allows new molecules and compounds to form. Whenever two or more atoms bond, they form a molecule. To bond means to join together. A compound is a combination of two or more different kinds of atoms bonded together. Think of atoms like puzzle pieces, fitting together with other atoms to form bigger pieces of matter. Understanding the structure of atoms and how they combine is an important part of material science because each kind of material has the properties it does because of the number and kind of atoms that make it up. Molecules and compounds. For example, oxygen is a molecule but not a compound because it is made up of two oxygen atoms bonded together. In contrast, water is both a molecule and a compound because it is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Water is also an example of a pure substance because it is made up entirely of one kind of atom or molecule that has distinct properties that do not vary from sample to sample. With only three atoms, water is a small molecule. Other molecules can be much larger. 
one molecule of vitamin C is made up of 20 atoms, six carbon atoms, six hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. Some molecules are made up of many thousands of atoms bonded together. Chemical reactions. Molecules and compounds are formed as a result of chemical reaction between two or more atoms. In a chemical reaction, the atoms that make up the original substances are rearranged into a new substance that has different properties from the original substance. A result of this process is that the substance formed has different properties than the original substances. For example, at normal room temperature, both oxygen and hydrogen elements are gases. When hydrogen and oxygen bond in a molecule of water, they change into a liquid instead of a gas at room temperature. These changes are chemical changes because they rearrange the chemical structure of the substances through a chemical reaction. In any chemical reaction, the atoms and molecules that interact together are called reactants. The atoms and molecules produced by the reaction are called products. When the reactants come together, energy breaks the bonds holding the reactants together and rearranges them to form new products. The total number of atoms does not change in a chemical reaction. Because of this, the mass of any one element at the beginning of a reaction will equal the mass of the element at the end of the reaction. This is called conservation of mass, which is the theory that states that matter is never created or destroyed. This means that the more reactants you add to the chemical reaction, the more products will form. It is always true that mass is conserved in a chemical reaction. However, this can be difficult to measure in the real world because matter can interact with the environment. For example, if a gas is produced in a chemical reaction, it will fill whatever space it is in. This is impossible to measure. For this reason, scientists sometimes conduct closed system experiments so that matter cannot be exchanged with the environment. They do this when they want to isolate the reaction from the environment. In every chemical reaction, the reactants form a system that interacts with the surrounding environment. As the reactants combine and rearrange, energy is exchanged between the system and the environment. Heat is energy transferred when two objects or systems are at different temperatures. Endothermic versus exothermic reactions. Every chemical reaction needs energy to get started. This initial input of energy is called activation energy. When someone strikes a match to light a candle, they provide the activation energy needed to start a fire, which is a chemical reaction. Once the reaction begins, some reactions absorb more energy from the environment than they release. Others release more energy into the environment than they absorb. The difference between the different kinds of reactions can be understood by thinking about the energy required to break the bonds of the reactants compared to the energy needed to form the new bonds of the products. Endothermic or exothermic? Whenever a process occurs in which the system absorbs heat, it is called endothermic. Endo means to draw in. In an endothermic reaction, more energy is needed to break the bonds of the reactants than is released when new bonds form in the products. Because energy is never created or destroyed, this energy transfers from the environment into the system. We can't observe these changes at the molecular level, but we can measure the temperature change that results. We see evidence of this transfer of energy when the environment's temperature decreases because it means that the reaction has absorbed energy from the environment. A chemical ice pack uses an endothermic reaction to get cold. Many ice packs have ammonium nitrate and water kept in separate sections within a thin barrier between them, with a thin barrier between them. When you break the barrier, the water and ammonium nitrate combine more energy is needed to break the bonds of the reactants than is released when new bonds form in the products. This is why the ice packs get cold. When the reactants have fully reacted, the chemical reaction stops. Exothermic processes. Any process in which the system loses heat to the environment is called exothermic. Exo means to give off. 
In an exothermic reaction, less energy is needed to break the bonds of the reactants than is released when new bonds form in the products. Because energy is never created or destroyed, this extra energy is transferred into the environment. If the energy is released as heat, the environment's temperature will increase. There are many examples of exothermic reactions. For example, whenever you light a match, you are witnessing an exothermic reaction take place. The light and heat produced are evidence that energy is being released into the environment. Another common example of exothermic reactions occur in certain animals that produce and release light. Called bioluminescence, this phenomena occurs in animals that live in the ocean, as well as some land animals such as fireflies. The strength of a chemical reaction can be measured by the amount of energy absorbed or released by the reaction. When more reactants are added, it increases the amount of energy that is absorbed or released. Forms of energy. Forms of potential energy. Chemical. Energy stored in the bonds of atoms and molecules. Example, food, wood, gasoline. Gravitational. Stored energy related to an object's height above the ground. Example, a roller coaster at the top of a track. Nuclear. Energy stored in the nucleus of an atom. Example, energy that holds the nucleus together. Elastic. Energy stored in objects when stretched. Example, compressed springs, stretched rubber bands, compressed bouncy balls. Static electricity. Energy stored in an electric charge. Example, static charged balloons. Forms of kinetic energy. Thermal, the motion of atoms and molecules in a substance or object as its temperature increases. Example, boiling water. Sound, energy produced by sound vibrations moving through a substance in waves. Example, music or talking. Light, the movement of energy in a wavelength, uh, I'm sorry, a wave-like pattern that comes from light. Example, visible light, x-rays. Mechanical, the energy of a substance or system due to its motion. Example, car moving, windmill blades turning. Current electricity, the movement of charged particles through a conductor. Example, electricity and lightning. Section two, designing materials. Discovering Teflon. One of the only surfaces that geckos can't stick to is Teflon, the same kind of material used in cooking pans to make them nonstick. Teflon was first discovered by accident in 1938 by a young scientist named Roy Plunkett. At the age of 27, Plunkett was working in the lab trying to come up with a chemical to use in refrigerators. He decided to use a gas, which he stored in metal cans with a valve release, similar to hairspray cans today. On the morning he tried to release the gas from the can, Plunkett realized he couldn't get the gas out of the can. However, the can weighed the same as it had when the gas was added. Plunkett was curious as to what was going on. He cut open the metal can and discovered that the gas had turned into a white powder that was unusually slippery. Teflon is a synthetic polymer. Plunkett was intrigued. He tested the unknown white powder for its properties. He discovered that the white powder was heat resistant and had a low surface friction, which meant that most other substances wouldn't stick to it. That white powder would later be named Teflon. Without meaning to, Plunkett had produced a synthetic polymer. Polymers are large molecules that are made up of many smaller molecules bonded together in a repeating chain-like pattern. Polymers are all around us. DNA, spider silk, natural rubber, and protein are all examples of natural occurring polymers. Plastics, nylon, acrylic, and Teflon are examples of synthetic polymers. Polymer structure and function. Teflon is so slippery because of its structure. It is made up of the elements carbon and fluorine, making it both a molecule and a compound. 
The fluoride atoms completely surround the carbon atoms, so no other outside atoms can get near the carbon to react with it. It is this structure that makes geckos unable to stick to its surface. Properties of polymers. All polymers, including silk, Teflon, and nylon, share certain properties because they are all huge molecules with hundreds and sometimes thousands of atoms per molecule. Their structure gives them unique properties. For example, polymers are so large that they become entangled with each other. Think of one polymer molecule as a piece of cooked spaghetti. In a bowl of spaghetti, that one piece of cooked spaghetti gets tangled up with all of the other pieces of pasta. It is very difficult to separate one piece of spaghetti from the remaining pieces because the strands of spaghetti are tangled together. Polymer molecules are arranged in a similar way, and this structure gives polymers some of their distinctive properties. For example, polymers are elastic, similar to how rubber bands are elastic. They can all flow, similar to how silly putty can flow. These properties occur because the polymer molecules can slide past one another, but they are still connected together. Another way of thinking about the structure of polymers is to picture a box filled with steel chains. Each chain is made up of hundreds of individual links, but the chains themselves are not connected to any other chain. In this example, each steel chain represents one polymer molecule made up of hundreds or thousands of atoms, chain links. If you were to reach into the box and grab a chain, you could pull out an individual chain. But now imagine that you add a lot of tiny magnets into the box. Those magnets would attract the steel chains, connecting the individual chains into one large mass of chains. If you were to reach into the box and grab a chain now, you would pull out the entire mass of chains. School glue and sodium borate. To understand how this applies to polymers, let's look at a simple chemical reaction between school glue and a substance called sodium borate, which is common in detergents and cosmetics. By itself, glue is a synthetic polymer made up of molecules of polyvinyl acetate. It is a sticky liquid. Sodium borate is a solid powder that can be dissolved in water. Remember that box of steel chains. The glue is like the steel chains made up of long chains of molecules strung together. When you dissolve sodium borax in water and then add it to the glue, it has the same effect as adding the magnets to the steel chains. The sodium borate molecules react with the molecules of polyvinyl acetate, bonding at random places on the polyvinyl acetate molecule chains. The result is a new substance that is made up of tangled, long, flexible, crossed, linked chains that are stretchy and bouncy. Experimenting with polymers. Understanding the relationship between a poly polymer's molecular structure and its properties allows material scientists to design new synthetic materials. For example, in 1930, several years before the surprise discovery of Teflon, a researcher named Wallace Carothers used his knowledge of polymers to create new synthetic materials that would be used in clothing. He wanted a material that was durable, flexible, and elastic. He had a good understanding of basic polymer structure, namely that they were large molecules made up of long chains of repeating units of atoms, which gave them the properties he was interested in. He had been experimenting with synthetic polymers for six years. He and his team of researchers began by creating the first polyester fibers. These fibers became extremely elastic when cooled. However, this material wasn't very practical because it had a low melting point. This meant that laundering and ironing weren't possible. Teflon is discovered. So Carothers and his team kept experimenting with different chemicals in an effort to come up with a polymer that was flexible and sturdy, but also had a high melting point. Six years later, they combined two chemicals, hexamethylene, diamine, and adipic acid. When combined, a chemical reaction occurred that produced a gooey blob that could be drawn in long, thin elastic fibers. Each molecule consists of 100 or more repeating units of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms strung in a chain. This was the first nylon. 
One of the reasons that nylon is so resilient is that a single strand may be made up of more than one million molecules. When stretched, each of those molecules takes some of the pressure. Section three, manufacturing, making crayons. Twice a week, trains with cars full of paraffin wax pull up to the Crayola factory in Pennsylvania. Paraffin wax is a material that is made up of between 20 and 40 atoms of carbon, as well as hydrogen atoms. It is a white, odorless, tasteless, waxy, pliable solid. That paraffin wax is the main ingredient of crayons. Before you can buy crayons at the store and use them, the materials that make them up have to be processed. This operation of transforming raw materials into a finished product is called manufacturing. Manufacturing is what builds all of the stuff that surrounds you from the nails and screws that hold your desk together to your cell phone, your clothes, and your car. Paraffin wax is a raw material because it is a basic material from which a product is made. Understanding the basic atomic structure of paraffin wax and its resulting properties is an important first step in manufacturing crayons. Nylon is another raw material that can be used in many different applications, including toothbrushes, women's stockings and other clothing, carpets, hoses, parachutes, racket strings, and dental floss. Process is, a very, is very important in manufacturing. A process is any series of steps designed to meet a goal. For example, the scientific process is designed to help scientists meet the goal of answering a question. Manufacturing processes refer to the series of steps designed to transform raw materials into a finished product. Different industries follow different processes depending on the product being made. However, all manufacturing processes involve several basic goals. First, the materials have to be formed into the desired shape. Secondly, their properties have to be changed or improved to better achieved, achieve the desired function. When the, train reach, when the trains reach Crayola's factory in Pennsylvania, the wax is heated until it melts. Here, it's important to know about more of paraffin wax's properties, including its melting point. Crayons melt at 40 degrees Celsius, or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Then, the wax is mixed together with color pigments, which are like colored flour. For this step again, scientists need to know the properties of paraffin wax and how it interacts with other materials. Paraffin wax doesn't mix with liquids, so the color pigment needs to be in solid or powder form. Crayola makes 120 different colors of crayon. The wax is also mixed with other chemicals, which the company doesn't reveal. These ingredients give crayons the specific properties that they have. Crayon molds. Once the color pigments are mixed with the wax and stirred so that the color is eventually distributed throughout, the hot wax mixture is poured into molding machines. A mold is a hollow container that is filled with a liquid or a pliable material such as the heated wax or plastic. A single Crayola mold makes 1,200 crayons at a time. Cold water travels through tubes in the molds to cool the wax down. When the material cools, it hardens in the shape of the mold. This manufacturing process is often called forming during which the shape of the material is changed into a specific form. In about four to seven minutes, the wax in the mold cools and becomes solid. Workers scrape off the top of the mold and the extra wax will be melted and used again. The mold then extrudes the crayons. Extrusion refers to a manufacturing process in which a material is put into a chamber and pressed out through a hole, also called a die. Extrusion is an example of a physical process because it doesn't change the chemical structure of the material. Other physical processes include cutting and sanding. Some processes are chemical because they change the chemical structure of a material. For example, some kinds of plastic are heated to make them more rigid. Similarly, nylon is cooled to make it more elastic. After they have been extruded, 
Each crayon is inspected for breaks and chips, as well as bubbles, which can appear if mixing has not been complete. Those crayons that are rejected will be remelted and molded. This process is called quality control, a process that reviews the fitness of production by comparing items produced to a production standard. This process includes product inspection, where someone examines the final product for unacceptable defects, such as cracks. Labeling crayons. Then, a machine puts labels on the crayons. Before 1943, farmers used to hand wrap the crayons during the winter months. However, using a machine allows many more crayons to be labeled in a much shorter time period. People take crayons to a collecting, to a, a collating machine where 16 different colors of crayons are put together and mixed into a little box. More colors in more little boxes are added together in the final product. This process is called assembling, when all of the components are assembled into a whole product. Efficiency is an important factor at this point in the process. The fewer parts needed to assemble the product, the less time, and therefore lower cost, it will take to put it together. Additionally, manufacturers try to design parts that are easy to hold, move, and attach to decrease the amount of time needed to put all of the parts together. Crayola's manufacturing process is very efficient. It allows the company to manufacture 8,500 crayons per minute, 13.5 million crayons per day, and 3 billion crayons per year. It is so efficient because many of the processes are done by machines. Manufacturing processes. Factories around the world manufacture many products that our society depends on, from crayons to medicine, cars, clothes, computers, phones, and construction equipment, to list just a few. In each of these factories, manufacturing processes are carefully followed. Manufacturers need to follow set processes because they want to make sure that the goods they produce meet certain design and safety standards. The process helps ensure that every step is properly followed and that the end products are equal in design, durability, and safety. Manufacturing processes depend on the materials used and the type of product being manufactured. For example, a company that makes a variety of different toys has a manufacturing process that has 65 major steps. Boeing is another company for whom a solid manufacturing process is essential. It has the largest building in the world, located in Everett, Washington. From this location, it has manufactured almost 4,000 airplanes. The main building covers 98.3 acres. In 2006, Boeing employees realized that they could improve the efficiency of their manufacturing process for their 777 airplanes. In the traditional process, the airplanes being made remained stationary, parked wing to wing next to each other. However, employees realized they could improve their process by switching to a moving assembly line where the planes were positioned nose to tail so that they could move. Having a process in place was important because the 777 airplane was about 3 million parts. When complete, it weighs 166,441 kilograms or 366,940 pounds. Just the paint alone adds hundreds of pounds of weight to the plane. Painting is part of finishing, the process when additional features are added to complete the look of the product. Painting and polishing are part of the finishing process, as is adding decorative features to the product. Wow, I really learned a lot reading molecules to materials, and I hope that you did too. I'll see you tomorrow with another one. Bye.